Hello and welcome to this, the Time for Advice Digital Transformation video series. Over the course of this series, we'll be interviewing industry figures to see what they understand by digital transformation and how they see it impacting financial advice and wealth management businesses. Our guests will include industry pundits and practitioners. All will have their own views and we hope that you'll find them interesting and informative. As a provider of technology solutions to financial advisors, we have no doubt about the value digital transformation can deliver a business, not only in increased profits, but also in long-term sustainability. It's important to remember that digital transformation is a journey and all firms will be at different stages of that journey, some well advanced, others just starting. There's no doubt it's challenging, but we believe firms need to think big, start small, but just start. Now, digital transformation means different things to different people. And so I'm delighted to have uh, joining me on this call shortly, Ian Horn, who's head of audience development at CityWire. Um, let's kick off. Let's get on with it. And um, so okay. firstly, firstly, you know, welcome and thank you very much for joining me today. It's okay, really good you. to see you in, no, no, our, in, our, in our lockdown period. So, okay. so let's kick off by um, you telling us a little bit about your background and how you ended up at CityWire. Yeah, sure, we'll do. Also, media professional here, not making use of the angles. Let me sort that out. There we go. That's, That's okay. Yeah, I, I don't mind looking up your nose. Better. It's not a problem, mate. <laughs> <laughs> it might be for other people, so just in case. Um, yeah, so my background is a strange one. Um, I was a content writer for many years uh, by accident rather than design. I, uh, I was at university and a friend of mine was, was writing interviews, sat in his front, well, sat in his room wearing nothing but his pants and it looked like an easy way to make money. Um, I had no aspirations to be a writer, but I saw that and I thought, well, okay, let's have a go. Um, and then that took me on a wild adventure of content writing. So I followed the tennis tours, the ATP and the women's tennis tour for about five years, um, mostly from my front room watching it on TV. But I did get out of the joke and I did get to uh, ask questions to Roger Federer and Maria Sharapova and Rafael Nadal and a few others. So, I mean, it, that was an incredible experience in its own right. Uh, and then I did some writing for country music magazines, strangely. I lived in America for a year um, before it went completely mad. It was slightly mad back then. And yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I, used to, I used to cover the country scene. So I've interviewed a few kind of award-winning country artists too. Um, but then I decided it was time for my, my real career to start. I had to wear a blue suit. So I've off to, off to the city to work for CityWire. And for the last six years, I've been, I've been traveling around the country meeting financial advisors. And yeah, and, and that's, that's taken on a life of its own recently where I've taken up our um, FinTech column. So I now write our weekly tech travels piece. Um, and there's all sorts of elements to it too, but generally I'm, I'm there to listen to advisors and what they're doing um, and, and try and kind of stay on top of any trends that are going on in the industry. Well, I thought your round country tour video, the documentary you did asking about financial advice around the country was excellent. And I mean, to be fair, Ian, you're a bit of a media star. <laughs> well, no one's ever called me that, but I'll, I'll take it. I'll, I'll gladly take it. Um, do you know what was funny with that? I just figured that the advice market is, it, I don't know, it has an odd reputation. So when I'm speaking to friends about it, um, people don't say, oh, I want a financial advisor. The conversation always starts with a friend of mine saying, Ian, should I invest in cryptocurrency? Or, <laughs> you know, or, or if it's more wild, it'll be Ian, should I invest in medicinal cannabis or something like that? And when I say, well, have you ever thought about a financial advisor? And it's amazing how many people who think that crypto or medicinal cannabis is the answer to their problems won't actually consider an advisor. So I thought, you know, what, it's time to actually look at this market for what it is and let people know there are good people in it. So, yeah. you know, that was that was around the country tour. And, you know, I hope people watch that. I hope more people watch it. But the idea is to kind of get across that advice isn't bad. It's not what people expect it to be. And there are so many good people in the profession that are there to give proper financial planning. It's just people probably don't know how to find those people or don't know what they're looking for. So yeah, a big challenge, but a lot of fun making that video. Well, what, what we'll do uh, with your permission is we'll put the link onto this blog. So when we socialize this video, yeah. um, we'll put that link onto the uh, blog as well. So people can watch it because it's well worth watching. I, I thought, it was, I thought yeah. it was great. And I thought you managed the whole uh, interview process really nicely. So it was a, a, a good, uh, good documentary. But Thank I mean, obviously in your travails, I mean, uh, obviously you met up with uh, uh, Adrian Murphy up in, in mm -hmm. Glasgow and, and all, all over the place. And it was fascinating, but you must have, picked up some interesting insights in terms of you know how financial advisors operate and where their challenges are so uh, you know from that and obviously your experience at CityWire what do you think the biggest challenges facing financial advisors are? 
Now, it's, it's a good question, and it's one which I will fudge a little bit because advice businesses are so wildly different. Yeah. I mean, you've got you know, your large kind of national companies, your networks, and then the smaller IFAs, but the smaller ones all, are also different. You've got some people approaching retirement just looking to sell off. You've yeah. got some people looking to be the next big thing in advice. You've got some people just wanting to run a small firm in a, in a small town or village somewhere. And yeah. the challenges they all face are different. The one they always moan about is the regulation, of course. Um, I think <laughs> going going on a video and slating the FCA is probably not a smart move. Um, we would we'll never do that. We, we love the FCA. That. We would yeah. never do that, would we? Exactly. Of course not. No. And I think actually now is a good time to be an advisor. So yeah, there are challenges, but um, you know you can look at regulation as being difficult, and it is difficult, but you know maybe it should be. Uh, and then the other side of things is is obviously we're in a lockdown, and and people have got in a position now where you've got to communicate with clients in a way that you haven't had to before. And I think people have adapted really well to that, but it is still a big challenge in its own right. And also writing new business. I mean, if I just started a new business now and I didn't have a strong online presence, I'd be quite worried because it's, it's easy to have conversations with people on Zoom or you know Teams or whatever, yeah. but actually converting someone to a client and having that proper sales pitch, that, that's a lot trickier if you don't have that existing relationship. So I think that's tough. Um, yeah. Of course, the digital side of it, I think is massive as well. Uh, you know, if you're trying to find a lasting business, you've got to look at the other trends that people are talking about. So people say, you know, what if Apple or Amazon or Google got into the market uh, and who's to say they won't one day. Um, and if they do, then you really want to be someone who is ready for the digital future that we're going to have. I think you need to have the capacity to communicate with clients in all sorts of different ways, uh, be that an app, be it online, um, you know, even things like WhatsApp. I mean, even that's basic, but I think... Yeah you know, things are changing now. So I think you need to be accessible. Uh, the information needs to be in the right place at the right time. And I think you need a relationship now where advice, well, clients, sorry, can be proactive as much as the advisor should they want to be, but yeah. hopefully not in a way that creates nightmares for the advisor, because if people don't know what, what to ask about, or they ask the wrong questions, that can be quite time consuming. Um, yeah. And I think, I think when you look at the future of the advice market, you, you know, there's a big challenge with the advice gap and that's, one way I see things going. So look, look at this kind of technological world. We do things better and bigger. I yeah. think what we look towards is a kind of two tier system where on the one hand, we, you know, we scale things up, but we personalize them and we make things bigger and better and more exciting. You know, some of the tech I look at for my weekly column is quite interesting. There was one thing, uh, a family office platform, which had the capacity to have, have a look at what's going on with your racehorses and your, and your yacht and your sports cars and your wine cellar. I mean, I think we'll see more stuff like that. Um, and then on the other side of things, we've got this big advice gap to look after. So I think at the top end, uh, advice, you know, technology will be used to really, really push things on and create, you know, in tandem with that great life fa financial planning, uh, in tandem with that brilliant stuff like life coaching when it's done properly. Um, we'll get that. And on the other hand, we have to fill this advice gap problem. So well, I'm going I'm to come on to that. And I'm going to come on to that in a few seconds. And in fact, um, one of the things that you've been mentioning throughout that last section was uh, the need for digital. And of course, this series that we're doing is all about digital transformation. But if we just scale it back right yeah. down to basics, because I think for a lot of um, people, this is new. You know, yeah. this is a, a com something completely different. Um, and a, a lot of people haven't really yet grasped what digital transformation means. So, so I mean, from your perspective, what does digital transformation mean to, for an advice firm, for example? Mm -hmm. Well, as, as you say, it's a big question. And for me, I think it means looking at all the, you, know, you break down tasks, right, into things that people can do, things that computers can do, um, you know, it's about finding things in the gap where people currently do them, but they'd be done just as well by, by automation yeah. uh, and taking out as much grunt work as you can and, okay. and getting to a position where the advisor's time is freed up to do stuff that only a person can do. Um, okay. so that's, it's quite broad concept stuff and it can seem a bit, a bit wild when you compare it to typical financial planning. Yeah. But again, I'm, I'm looking towards the future. So digital transformation for me is, create you know getting rid of them things that you don't want to do but can be automated in a compliant way and then devoting your time to either scaling your business or having more in-depth conversations with those clients you already have 
so so I think I think um, that what you've done is you've you've nicely encapsulated um, the components of digital transformation. At the beginning, it all has to start and end with data, frankly, uh, yes. because at the end of without data, and people tend not to mention data because, of course, it's so blindingly obvious. Yet, uh, I'm sure you've already seen in your travails, um, you know, the, the vast majority of firms really sort of pay lip service to their data because it tends to be spread like a rash across multiple Excel mm -hmm. spreadsheets, and there's a massive disconnect and inefficiency in businesses, certainly the business that we see pretty much every day. Uh, so I guess it's all, it starts with data, first and foremost. You've got to get your data held in a structured database with full access. And, uh, and from there, of course, you're right, automation. So take those routine tasks that steal time and automate them, whether that be process automation or document automation or whatever. Mm -hmm. But then I guess you're into, um, you know, surfacing information, meaningful information that's actionable. And then I suppose when we start to look slightly beyond the horizon into AI and machine learning, what that potentially can do for a business, not only in its ability to service its clients better, but also to run its business better. And I suppose that's very much uh, um, on the horizon. It's just how firms are going to be able to take advantage of that, given the current state of the technology in common use. So, so one of the things and one of the themes that you um, paid a lot of attention to in your um, documentary, uh, as our, our viewers will see, was, of course, uh, access to financial advice. And that yeah. is a real, real challenge. I mean, you've got the statistics at your fingertips, um, but, you know, very broad brush. I think there are about 30, 40 million people in the UK that could probably do with financial advice. Yet financial advisors probably surface between three and a half and four million of those consumers. So, so what scope is there do you think for increasing access to financial advice i think it's massive i think there's you know the documentary funnily enough was it i did that documentary before i started looking at tech more closely yeah. um obviously there is there is again some some attention kind of lip service paid towards tech in that documentary but um you know the first part of the challenge is what i identified in that which is your, your kind of marketing problem um yeah. you know if you if you walk on the high street and ask someone at random name a financial advice business I don't think there's much of a chance they'll be able to name one, really. I think, you know, not even a recognized brand or anything like that. Um, so people don't know what advice is. It speaks to the problem I, I mentioned earlier. They don't know what advice is, how it will help their lives. And also sometimes the, the, the merit of advice these days is that it does brilliant things for you, but it does the boring things first. It's easy to sell a, a you know, a get rich quick scheme, but yeah. to tell someone you should have your assets in a diversified, you know, diversified portfolio of stocks, it is kind of decidedly less sexy, so it's kind of harder to do. Um, I know, <laughs> surprising. Money's boring. Money's bo look, money's really boring, isn't it? The thought of money mm. is really boring. I think that's half the battle. It's mm. boring, so it's it's important, but boring. It's a, it's not urgent, unless, of course, you don't have any, in which case it's very urgent indeed, and you think of nothing else. I mean, it's a bit like oxygen to that extent. Yeah. But uh, I think like everything else, it's, you know, unless you are able to bring order and focus to your money, then time just goes by and then one day you're going to wake up without any, I guess. So, yeah. <laughs> so, okay. so how, 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 do we, how do we address that? I mean, you've talked about communication and mm -hmm. of course, communicating the right message to the right people at the right time is the foundation mm -hmm. of great um, relationship mm -hmm. management. Uh, but in, in your experience, how do financial advisors fare in this particular area? And what does what the future it? of communication look like? It's interesting. I, I don't think advisors, and again, I, I generally try to side with people that are reading our publication, right? But I don't think they necessarily are the best at communicating. But it really depends, because again, broad brush stroke, looking at a whole industry. Um, some people do it very well. Um, but communication, I mean, typically, there are a lot of firms who have for years and would continue to do so, done perfectly well just off of client referrals. It's completely fine. They write good business. They do good, good advice. But if we're looking more broadly at how do we grow the market of advice uh, and how do we solve things like the advice gap, then actually the communication on that level is quite poor. We do, you know, as much as I, as I did say that money is not always that exciting, you look at other aspects of it, you know, the life planning stuff, uh, helping people to achieve their dreams and ambitions, that stuff can be quite exciting. Um, yeah. You know, and, and rather than get their message across in a good way with, you know, videos or, um, you know, the documentary was kind of trying to look at that as well. What you typically get is an advice website with a stock photo of an old couple walking down the beach. <laughs> it's great, but I mean, it's not getting it across to anyone that this is an exciting thing. Yeah, um, yeah. So there's loads we can do. I, I think the tech side of it, again, is important. Um, you know, we need to make sure it's effective communication, of course. Them kind of chat bots things can be, can be hit or miss, can't they? 
Um, but I mean, speaking to some of the people that use the technology, and again, another article I did was with David Stamp, who's yeah, from yeah. my hometown. And, uh, you know, he, he has 2,000 clients on his book as, a, as an advisor. You know, most yeah. people only have 100. Yeah. And, you know, it's quite clear to me that we can, if we make the advice process easier and automate the things that are, you know, less important, or not less important, sorry, but, uh, but can be automated, we can then focus on marketing to people and getting the message out there. So I think it's about, you know, <laughs> that, that we're basically not doing a very good job of communicating the value of advice and that will help. And then with technology facilitating more time to promote that, I think we'll be on the right track. Well, David Stamp is a client of ours. And obviously we use his headline 2000 clients per advisor, which is like 10 times the, uh, the national average, in fact, 20 times the national average. I mean, that's a significant uplift in terms of, uh, you know, access to the widest possible market, but digitizing your process. But also he maintains that personal connection as well, because, mm -hmm. of course, you know, digitization extends your reach in a way that I think clients appreciate it. And, and maybe this is one of the big challenges, because a lot of financial advisors businesses and I'm sure you've seen it spend a lot of time um, creating review reports you know every year they get a comprehensive review report you know spend hours and hours compiling mm -hmm. these things uh, because their technology just isn't up to muster yeah. uh, and they can't get it off at the click of a button um, and then the client gets it and puts it straight in the bin because they just don't want yeah. that and, okay. and you know exactly what you were saying earlier as well it's about that data getting sent between different sources to actually, you know, th there's got to be ways to trigger so you know as an advisor when you have to speak to the client. Yeah. Um, you know, an annual review, you know, I can see the benefits of having one to some extent, but, but what happens every 12 months that means a review, should, you know, it's just an amount of time that seems kind of right because of the calendar year, yeah, you know, yeah. rather than being we're triggering a, re a review because A, B or C has happened and we know we now need to review your circumstances. So I think with better data, we can have better communication. And again, another point you made, timely communication. You know, yeah. we might have a better understanding of when people really need the help and then be more valuable, you know, <laughs> to them if, you know, because of that. And, and, and I think you're right about the, the, the periodic review. And I was talking to Sam Seaton, CEO of, um, of Money Hub uh, mm -hmm. recently. And of course, they're doing some really interesting work about how to keep their clients engaged using the Money Hub portal. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the comments that Sam said was, uh, or, or made was about, you know, this annual review concept, who cares about an annual review? What's mm -hmm. special about that date in the diary every year? Surely it should be in ongoing second by second review surely there should be something that is monitoring your plan every day and if things change for whatever reason and you need to be engaged it nudges you to take action Mm -hmm. and and the advisor at the same time so actually you know uh the system is just monitoring progress in the background using open finance as sam talks about it so getting the data fed in analyzing it and then comparing it um, you know actuals against projected and if things change the system comes alive and just gives you a little bit of nudge to do something at both sides the advice side and the client side so that you know the the, the client realizes there's a conversation to be had and that i think plays in nicely to my next question which of course is going to be something that's um, very close to your heart and that's the uh, intergenerational wealth uh, yeah. they've been they've been talking now I think something like three to four trillion pounds at some stage in the near future is going to be cascading down the generations um, and and uh, of course you also hear the research again you'll know it better than me where 67 percent of the children of parents with advisors are going to sack their parents advisor um, how do you engage with the next gen and how do you you know the the, the beneficiaries of this enormous wealth and so how do firms then build in that long-term sustainable business model where at the moment it's clearly risk uh, risk yeah yeah absolutely uh, and i think it's funny because it's easy to kind of categorize millennials uh, in, in, in some respects i'm a typical one and that I, I you know i'm rubbish answering phone calls um <laughs> but, but far better on email so you, you get things like that um but it's still a mixture of things i think it's still important to have them early conversations bring younger people into the office when you're first talking about things like you know, IHT or estate planning, like you don't want to have that conversation for the first time when someone's just passed away. That's yeah. probably the worst time. Um, well, emotionally, at least. Um, yeah, of, then, course. of course, there is a tech side of it too. I mean, you know, people communicate differently. People don't necessarily want the same service that you've given your whole career. Yeah. Um, and, and it's varied. I mean, not everyone's the same. I don't think it's necessarily as simple as older people want proposition X, younger people want proposition Y. I think some older people want the technology led stuff 
and some younger people probably want the more face-to-face -face stuff but I think you need to offer a kind of a wider range of things so you can be approachable and accessible things like hubs I think I think uh, you know portals I think are particularly helpful um, you know and things that offer a bit of transparency and give people the kind of level of service they used to getting from elsewhere I mean you know there's definitely a trend towards immediacy and convenience yeah. Yeah. Uh, in the way that people consume and the way people you know respond to stuff so uh, I think that's only going to continue for the foreseeable future so you, you can need to realize the market you're in and the world that you're in and try and prepare for that so yeah I mean sometimes the old-fashioned approach won't necessarily be good enough if you're going to have younger people inheriting the wealth then prepare your proposition to kind of cater to the needs they'll have because you know if again going back to that kind of very generic Amazon Google Apple point well, if those guys enter the market, they'll be offering all of that. And that might be, you know, and they're not going to struggle to communicate to that client, to that younger person. So, um, yeah, there's all sorts of challenges there. I, I think, I think again, um, digital has its place. There's no question about it. And as you quite mm -hmm. rightly say, the immediacy, the ability to engage with the person uh, really the way they want it. Uh, I think one of the challenges that we come across all the time, and certainly I've raised it with a number of other people I've, I've chatted with, and they seem to agree, is that um, perhaps one of the challenges IFAs have, and they haven't yet solved yet, is an appreciation and an understanding of what their clients actually value. Mm. Um, and it falls back to some research done back in 2007 by Sorelli Associates. I reference it all the time because it's stuck with me so graphically, where they asked financial advisors how they spend their time, and they asked their clients, what they value from their financial advisor and the financial advisors spend all of their time writing reports and not much time out seeing their clients and the clients didn't value that at all but really valued the face-to-face -face or the, 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 the personal touch because of course the thing which differentiates a financial advisor from say a digital process on the website uh, and LV um, found this to be true when they looked, started launching their online services initially they found and tracked their online browsers got to the point of pushing the button, you know, just about to push the button to buy, and then they left. They just couldn't bring themselves to push the button because, you know, going through the process is very academic and it's great, but actually when you come to decision point, it's a difficult thing to do. And they found that when they got a human to interact with that person at that point, then they increased their completion rates by something like 50%, a significant uplift. And I guess it comes down to that one thing. It comes down to the trusted advisor, doesn't it? The fact yes, that these... and, and the robo advisors have had this problem. You know, the ones I spoke to, and when, when you know, robo advice was meant to take over everything. Yeah, yeah. There's still that phone call. There's still that communication before. And um, yeah, you, you raise some good points about the review as well. I mean, again, bringing a media perspective into this. If someone said to me, "Okay, you need to tell people about their annual finances and make it as interesting as possible in a way that'll actually engage it," the client yeah. review is the very last way I would do that. No one cares. Yeah. No one can read that. You know, you, you look at the world of the way the media is going, you look at the way that people are reading things, engaging with things. You kind of need to cut to the chase. You need to, sometimes bullet points will do it. Sometimes you need yeah, to be yeah. direct in your message. Sometimes you need to be, you know, clear, obvious and, and engaging. You know, a video might be a better way of doing a client review. You know, a three or four minute Zoom video to someone saying, yeah, yeah. look at your account, here's what we think. Um, yeah. And then you can do it with the personal side. But yeah, I certainly think the way most people do reviews Look for, as an outsider looking in, I don't have to write these every day. I might be overlooking something, but they seem unengaging and they seem, <laughs> yeah, a bit, yeah, a bit of a faff. I wouldn't want to write one. What views have you got on the current advisor technology that's in place? And do you think, given that it was most of the solutions in market were launched um, in the mid to late 90s, early noughties, do you think it's possible for a firm to digitally transform their business when they're using on technology that was built on the wrong business model for a start, a pre-RDR business model? I mean, that's, that's a really good question. Um, and it's also something that I would, I would have brought up as well. Because much like the advice market is made up of so many different types of firms, so is the provider side of things. So, yeah, yeah. I, I think if you've got the old architecture, you, you, you've got a real challenge there to make everything capable of integration and, and speaking to other bits of technology. I think it's a, it's a weird market in that the larger firms have an advantage in reputation. People know who they are. Uh, you know, they've been around longer and there's some trust there. But yeah. the longer your technology has been in place, the, you know, the, the less relevant it becomes I, I had a really interesting chat a couple of weeks ago at our fintech forum event with um somi arian who's a a tech philosopher and she was um you know she came up with this idea of transitional um architecture basically it means your business in the digital age 
um, needs to be more like a tent than it is like a building, which sounds like kind of crazy stuff. But the whole point is, in the past, when you'd have a, a brand, a shop, a business, whatever, it was built to last. It was built in place. You know, it was yeah. built with that in mind. Whereas now, your business model might need to change every two years, three years. You need to be really kind of always thinking about the future. You never stop anywhere. You don't stop in any one place. As soon yeah. as you get used to a scenario and you start enjoying it, it is when you start to become irrelevant, which is yeah. kind of strange. And it's probably not the same for every market, but it's an interesting concept and I quite like it. I think tech providers have that exact problem where as much as they've got their technology in place, they've constantly got to be thinking not just about build, you know, building something new, but possibly destroying what they've already got. And it does create some really difficult challenges, especially for an advisor who's trying to pick a tech provider as well. And then you've got newer people on the scene who have new, new, you know, new tech architecture, less legacy problems or fewer legacy problems. Um, you know, and picking between the two can be really tricky. So I think if you're, if you're looking to, you know, as an advisor looking to select tech, you need to be aware of, again, how well adapted the technology is for the future, how well it speaks to other things. Um, but then there's other sides to it too. I mean, people can find all sorts of gripes with technology and then never take the time to train their staff to use it properly. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's a, it's a, common, a common issue. Um, but yeah, you, you see all sorts. You see all sorts of like exciting um, you know, new things in technology. I mean, some of the people I've spoken to in the last few months have got some really, really fascinating solutions. You know, I've looked at people who have, have kind of automated real estate investments. So you can invest in Mayfair with a thousand pounds, which is quite cool. Uh, you, can, you know, I quite like that. You've got that one I mentioned earlier on where you can see how your wine cellar is getting on. You've got people that can, you know, follow your movements on your phone. So your tax reporting internationally is, is accurate. I think that's pretty cool too. I'm also seeing on Twitter that advisors can't use digital signatures with large providers, which is mad. And then you're also seeing things like, you know, a company with you know, loads of money, huge company, household names. I won't name any, but you see these things where someone says, I've been on hold for four and a half hours now and not had a response. I know. So it's actually staggering. So I don't think it's, you know, big and, and old is bad and small and nimble is necessarily always good, but it... <laughs> Technology is kind of odd. It, it sometimes flips your assumptions about what might be right. So you've got to ask some probing questions. You've got to do your due diligence before picking a technology. And you have to make sure it works for your business because your business isn't the same as the business next door. Yeah, spot on. And, and I think you're absolutely right. Um, you know, you can't be blind to what's coming around the corner. You know, I, I believe there's a wave coming. There is going to be massive change over the course of the next three to four to five years. And you just have to look at, you know the tech consumer tech that we use every day uh and how that's evolved in fact the automotive world how that's evolved all worlds are evolving changing massively and very rapidly our industry seems to be rather slow and stuck and of course that's why time for advice was set up so i've got to get my little advert in there <laughs> because of course because of course we're we're leveraging the microsoft dynamics ecosystem um and uh, taking advantage of all the tools that microsoft is investing billions of dollars in each year and i suppose that's that's for us is is absolutely the future the digital transformation platform that people are going to need in order to leverage the multiple different ways mm -hmm. of communicating with their clients in the future in Thank you so much. It's really nice to see you. Really Likewise. appreciate you spending time today and answering those questions. And, uh, and yeah, we'll, we'll pick up in the new year where hopefully we'll be through lockdown and we can do that face-to-face -face interview. We'll take stock of where we are. Sounds good. Thank you, Roland. Fantastic. Robert.